the human brain is big. It's unusually big for an animal our size. A chimpanzee, our closest living relative, has a brain about the size of a fist. Our brain is three times bigger. It weighs about three pounds, but it burns around 20% of our daily calories. It's a very expensive organ to run. So why do we have it? How did this strange, powerful, and greedy piece of hardware get built? It wasn't a single event. It was a long, slow process over millions of years. It was a story of food, tools, weather, and most importantly, other people. To understand it, we have to go back in time. Way back. Let's start around six million years ago. Our ancestors were ape, like creatures living in the forests of Africa. They were a lot like modern chimpanzees. They walked on all fours sometimes and had brains to match. Then something changed. The climate in Africa started to get drier. The dense forests began to shrink, replaced by open woodlands and vast savannas. This new environment presented a huge challenge. The old way of life, swinging through trees and eating fruit, wasn't going to cut it anymore. Our ancestors were forced out of the trees and onto the ground. They began to walk on two legs. Ebiptalism, walking upright, was a critical first step. It freed up the hands. Your hands that were no longer needed for walking could now be used for other things. They could carry food, they could carry babies, and eventually they could make and use tools. But for a long time, not much happened with the brain. Early hominins, like the famous Lucy and Australopithecus afarensis, who lived over three million years ago, walked upright but still had a small chimp-sized brain. They were essentially apes on two legs. Their brains were about 400 cubic centimeters. A modern human brain is closer to 1,400 cubic centimeters. So, the first big change was posture, not brains. But this change set the stage for everything that followed. For millions of years, our ancestors ambled around the savanna with small brains. Then, around 2.5 million years ago, we see the first real sign of a cognitive leap. The leap came in the form of stone tools. The first toolmakers were likely a species called Homo habilis, or Handy Man. Their tools were simple. They were just river cobbles with a few flakes knocked off to create a sharp edge. Archaeologists call them Oldoan tools. They weren't pretty, but they were a revolution. With a sharp stone flake, you could do things you could never do with your teeth and nails. You could slice meat off a carcass. You could smash open bones to get at the rich, fatty marrow inside. This was a game changer for our diet. Before tools, we were mostly plant eaters, maybe scavenging small bits of meat here and there. Now, we had a key to a new high-energy food source. Meat and marrow are packed with calories and fat. And brains are made of fat. They need huge amounts of energy to grow and operate. The shift to a diet richer in animal products provided the fuel needed for a bigger brain. It's hard to overstate how important this was. You can't build an expensive organ on a cheap diet. Eating leaves and fruit all day simply doesn't provide enough energy. By becoming meat eaters, or at least significant meat scavengers, our ancestors found a way to pay the high energy bill of a bigger brain. This created a feedback loop. Using tools required a slightly better brain. You had to know which rocks to pick, how to hit them just right, and how to use the resulting flake. Having access to meat and marrow with those tools provided the energy for that better brain to evolve. A smarter brain could then make even better tools, which got you more food, which fueled an even bigger brain. This cycle of tools, food, and brain growth pushed our evolution forward. Homo habilis had a brain around 600 cubic centimeters. Uh, a significant jump from Lucy, but still less than half the size of ours. The journey had just begun. This new diet had another, stranger effect. It changed our gut. Guts are also very expensive organs to maintain. Um, a plant-based diet requires a long, complex digestive system to break down tough cellulose. Think of a cow with its multiple stomachs. Meat, on the other hand, is much easier to digest. As our ancestors ate more energy-dense meat and marrow, they no longer needed such a big, energy-hungry gut. This led to what scientists call the expensive tissue hypothesis. The idea is simple. The body has a limited energy budget. You, you can't afford to run multiple expensive organs at once. So, a trade-off was made. As our brains got bigger, our guts got smaller. The energy saved from shrinking our digestive system was reallocated to our growing craniums. We traded gut for brain. Around 1.8 million years ago, a new hominin appeared on the scene, Homo erectus. This was a truly different kind of human ancestor. They were taller, with body proportions much more like our own. And their brains were bigger, starting around 800 cubic centimeters and growing over time.
Well, Homo erectus was also a much better toolmaker. They created what we call the Acheulean hand axe. Unlike the simple Old Dowan chopper, a hand axe was a symmetrical teardrop shaped tool. It was worked on both sides. Making a hand axe requires a lot more brain power than making a simple flake. You have to have a mental template of the final product in your mind before you start. You have to plan your strikes carefully. You have to be able to see a tool hidden inside a lump of rock. This suggests Homo erectus had advanced planning abilities and fine motor control. They were not just banging rocks together, they were sculpting them. Homo erectus was also the first of our ancestors to leave Africa. They spread out across Asia and Europe. This migration itself suggests a bigger brain at work. To survive in new, unfamiliar environments, you need to be adaptable. Uh, you need to solve new problems, find new food sources, and cope with new predators and climates. A bigger, more flexible brain is the ultimate tool for adaptability, and Homo erectus may have discovered another revolutionary technology fire. The evidence for the controlled use of fire is debated, but it seems to start somewhere around this time. Cooking food with fire was perhaps as important as the invention of stone tools. Where cooking does two amazing things. First, it makes food safer by killing bacteria and parasites. Second, it unlocks nutrients. Cooking breaks down tough fibers in plants and proteins in meat, making them much easier to digest. Um, it essentially externalizes part of the digestive process. Your stomach and intestines don't have to work as hard. This means you get far more energy out of the same amount of food. A cooked tuber gives you way more calories than a raw one. Cooked meat is digested more efficiently. This caloric bonus provided another massive boost of fuel for the brain. Some scientists, like Richard Wrangham, argue that cooking was the single most important factor in our brain's expansion. It gave us the cheap, high-quality energy we needed to power our heads, and it allowed our guts to shrink even further. The brain kept growing, but food and tools are only part of the story. There was another, equally powerful pressure shaping our minds, our social lives. Humans are intensely social creatures, we live in complex groups, and living in a group is mentally demanding. This is the core of the social brain hypothesis proposed by anthropologist Robin Dunbar. Dunbar noticed a correlation across primates. Species that live in larger, more complex social groups tend to have larger brains, specifically a larger neocortex. The neocortex is the wrinkled outer layer of the brain responsible for higher order thinking, like language and reasoning. Think about what it takes to navigate a social world. You need to keep track of who's who. You, you need to remember who is your ally and who is your rival. You need to understand the hierarchy. Who is dominant? Who is submissive? You need to track relationships not just between you and others, but between other individuals. Sarah is friends with John, but she dislikes Michael. If you help Michael, you might anger Sarah. It's a complex web of shifting alliances and obligations. To manage this, you need a powerful cognitive toolkit. You need a good memory. You need to be able to understand the intentions and beliefs of others, a skill called theory of mind. You need to be able to deceive, but also to detect deception in others. You need to cooperate to hunt or defend the group, but you also compete for mates and status within the group. As our ancestors' groups grew larger, the computational power needed to manage all these relationships skyrocketed. The brain, according to this hypothesis, is primarily a social tool. Its main job is to handle other people. This created another feedback loop. A bigger brain allowed for larger, more cohesive groups. Larger groups were better at finding food, defending against predators, and raising children. This success then favored individuals with even better social skills, and thus even bigger brains. The language likely evolved in this social context. It's the ultimate social tool. It allows us to share information efficiently. Instead of learning by trial and error, you can be told, don't eat those red berries, they're poisonous. It allows for better coordination during a hunt, and it allows for gossip. Gossip might sound trivial, but it's a vital social function. In a large group, you can't spend all your time physically grooming your allies the way monkeys and apes do. Language allows for a kind of vocal grooming. You can service your social relationships by talking, sharing information about others in the group. This helps bond the group together, and of course, language requires a lot of brain power. So we have a few major forces at work. A change in diet, fueled by tools and fire, provided the energy for a bigger brain. A complex social life, managed by language and cooperation, provided the problem that a bigger brain was needed to solve. There is one more piece of the puzzle, the environment itself. For most of our evolutionary history, the Earth climate was not stable. It, it went through dramatic swings, from warm and wet to cold and dry. The ice ages came and went. 
The African savanna, where our ancestors lived, was constantly changing. This instability created a unique evolutionary pressure. This idea is called the variability selection hypothesis. In a stable environment, the best strategy is to become highly specialized. If you only eat one type of plant, and that plant is always available, you can evolve a very efficient body and brain for doing just that. But what if your environment is unpredictable? What if the forest you live in one generation becomes a grassland the next? Specialization becomes a death sentence. In a world of constant change, the best survival trait is not specialization, but adaptability. You need a brain that can improvise, learn, and solve novel problems. You need to be a generalist, a jack-of-all-trades. Our big brains are the ultimate tool for flexibility. They allow us to live anywhere, from the frozen Arctic to the sweltering Amazon. We don't have thick fur, but we can invent clothing. We don't have sharp claws, but we can make spears. Uh, we aren't the fastest or the strongest, but we can outthink our prey and our predators. Our brain size might be a direct consequence of having to survive millions of years of environmental chaos. We evolved to be the planet's ultimate problem solvers. Let's track this growth through our more recent ancestors. After Homo erectus, we see the rise of species like Homo heidelbergensis, who lived in Africa and Europe from about 700,000 to 200,000 years ago. Their brains were even larger, averaging around 1,200 cubic centimeters, well within the modern human range. They were sophisticated hunters using long wooden spears to take down large game like horses and rhinos. This kind of hunting requires immense cooperation, planning, and communication. From Homo heidelbergensis, two main lineages diverged. One in Europe and Asia evolved into the Neanderthals. The other in Africa evolved into us, Homo sapiens. Neanderthals are often stereotyped as brutish cavemen, but that's completely wrong. They were intelligent, resourceful, and highly adapted to the cold climates of Ice Age Europe. And their brains were huge. On average, their brains were slightly larger than ours today. This is an important point. The story isn't just a simple line of ever-increasing brain size culminating in us. Neanderthals show that there are different ways to have a big brain. Their skulls were shaped differently from ours. They were longer and lower, while ours are more rounded and globular, like a soccer ball. This difference in shape reflects a difference in brain organization. Neanderthal brains seem to have had larger visual centers, perhaps an adaptation to the low light levels of northern latitudes. Their bodies were also more robust and muscular, and a larger portion of their brain might have been dedicated to controlling that larger body mass. Our brains, on the other hand, seem to have larger parietal lobes. These are areas involved in integrating sensory information, spatial awareness, and tool use. We also have a larger cerebellum, a structure at the back of the brain involved in fine motor control, and some researchers now think in higher cognitive functions like language and social planning. So while a Neanderthal brain was big, a Homo sapiens brain might have been wired differently. Maybe our advantage wasn't just raw size, but a more efficient or specialized organization. The first Homo sapiens appeared in Africa around 300,000 years ago. For a long time, their behavior wasn't dramatically different from that of other hominins. They made similar tools. But then, starting around 100,000 years ago, and really taking off about 50,000 years ago, we see a creative explosion. We see the first symbolic behavior art, jewelry, elaborate burials. This suggests a mind that could think in the abstract, that could create and share culture in a way no species had before. This cognitive revolution may have been the final key, allowing us to outcompete Neanderthals and spread across the entire planet. But this incredible brain came at a cost, a very steep cost. We've already discussed the massive energy bill, but there are other trade-offs. The biggest one is childbirth. A big brain requires a big head. But our move to walking upright narrowed the human pelvis. This created an evolutionary dilemma, a big head trying to pass through a small birth canal. Childbirth became incredibly dangerous for human mothers and infants. For much of our history, it was a leading cause of death for women. And the evolution found a brutal but effective solution. Human babies are born prematurely. Compared to other primates, a human infant is ridiculously helpless. A baby chimp can cling to its mother's fur from birth. A human baby can't even lift its own head. This is because a huge amount of our brain growth happens outside the womb. If a human baby stayed in the womb until it was as developed as a baby chimp, its head would be too big to ever get out. So we are born with small, underdeveloped brains that then undergo a massive growth spurt in the first few years of life. This has profound consequences. It means we have a very long period of childhood dependency. It takes years and years for a human child to become self-sufficient. 
This long childhood is necessary to grow that complex brain and to learn all the skills needed to be a successful human language, social rules, tool making, and cultural knowledge. This, in turn, placed a huge burden on parents, especially mothers. It required new social structures to support them. It likely favored pair bonding, where fathers invested in their offspring. It also led to the grandmother hypothesis, the idea that older, postmenopausal women played a crucial role by helping to care for and feed their grandchildren, allowing their daughters to have more children. Our entire social structure, from the nuclear family to the village, is in some way a response to the biological problem of raising a child with a slowly developing, oversized brain. So, how did the human brain get so big? It wasn't one thing. It was a cascade of interconnected factors, a web of feedback loops that played out over millions of years of trial and error. It started with a change in the environment that pushed our ancestors onto two feet, freeing their hands. Those hands eventually started making tools to get at new high quality foods like meat and marrow. This new diet provided the raw energy needed to fuel brain growth. Control of fire and cooking supercharged this process, making food even more energy efficient and allowing our guts to shrink, freeing up even more resources for the brain. At the same time, our social lives were becoming more complex. Living in larger groups required more cognitive horsepower to manage relationships, cooperate, and compete. This social pressure selected for better communicators, better mind readers, and better strategists. This language evolved as the ultimate tool for navigating this complex social world. And all of this happened against a backdrop of a constantly changing climate. The relentless environmental instability favored a brain that was not specialized but flexible and creative. A brain built for learning and problem solving. Each of these forces, tools, diet, society, and climate pushed on the others. Better tools meant a better diet, a better diet fueled a bigger brain, a bigger brain could manage a more complex social life. A more complex social life required better tools for communication, like language. And all of it made our ancestors better able to adapt to a chaotic world. The result is the three pound universe inside our skulls. It is an organ born of crisis and opportunity. It is incredibly powerful, allowing us to compose symphonies, write poetry, and ponder the nature of the cosmos. But it is also a demanding and fragile thing. It makes us intelligent, but it also makes childbirth perilous and our childhoods long and vulnerable. It is the product of a unique evolutionary journey, a compromise between enormous benefits and staggering costs. It is what makes us human.